Fighting Blindness Canada's Viewpoint is a virtual education series that brings you the latest in vision research presented by health experts from across Canada. The webinar you're about to watch is a recording. To learn more about the research we fund and upcoming webinars and events, please visit our website at fightingblindness.ca. This Viewpoint webinar is proudly presented by Bayer and supported by Allergan, Janssen, and Novartis. We'd also like to thank Accessible Media Inc., our national accessibility partner. Everyone here should download the AMI app, which is a fabulous resource. And you can watch excellent programming, including previous Fighting Blindness Canada events. Thank you for watching. We hope you enjoy this webinar and share your thoughts with us in the comment section below. And yeah, we're really excited to have you, Dr. Rai, here because this is our first first session on cataracts and uh, such an important topic and something we haven't talked about before. So I'm, I'm really excited to learn to learn a little bit more and to see what sort of questions um, our community has. Um, so to start with, I was wondering if you could just actually tell us what a cataract is. Sure. Uh, before we get to that, though, I just want to thank um, the Foundation Fighting Blindness for putting this on, Morgan, for all of her hard work, uh, and Dr. Moniz and Dr. Gold. You guys do incredible work. Um, and we're seeing that even in, in some of the comments that are being made here. So it really is incredible work. I've seen some of the, the research that the foundation funds, um, and it really is pushing the envelopes for what we can do as a society, as, as humans, and the difference that, that research makes in the lives of patients is incredible. So I want to commend everybody uh, for the hard work that the foundation does. Um, and it's, it really is my privilege to be here. So in, in terms of uh, Dr. Moniz's question, what is a cataract? So we all have a, a natural crystalline lens in our eyes. So that's what we call the lens. It's a crystalline lens and it is clear when we are, t t for most people when we're born, the lens is clear. Rarely a baby can be born with a cataract, but that's very rare. Uh, but you have a natural clear lens in your eye and it focuses light on the back of your eye on the retina. And what happens is as you age, um, one of the first changes that we notice with our natural crystalline lens is loss of accommodation. And so patients will often complain that they're not able to see things up close anymore. You'll see people holding menus further and further away, but the arm is only so long and eventually they start wearing reading glasses and they need stronger and stronger reading glasses through their forties and fifties. Eventually, there's a loss, so, so that's just a loss of accommodation with the lens. So it's not changing shape as, as well as it used to, um, but the patients are still seeing very well. They just need glasses. Eventually there's a loss of clarity and that's when you start to call it a cataract. Um, so many people um, by about their 50s or 60s, their, their optometrist will notice that there is some mild changes in their lens. Again, not a big deal, not necessarily needing cataract surgery, but that's the beginnings of, of, of a cataract is loss of clarity um, of the natural lens. And so, and, and there's different types of cataracts, um, nuclear cataracts, cortical cataracts, posterior subcapsular are the three most common types, but really what they all have in common is that they are a loss of clarity in the natural lens. Um. So you, you mentioned this a little bit when you were talking about as you sort of age, your doctor will, mention, will notice that maybe um, you're losing accommodation. Um, and so when you say accommodation, do you mean how flexible the lens is? Yeah, so accommodation is basically the ability for the lens to change shape and, and, and either flex or relax and allow you to see objects at different targets. So for example, when we're watching watching TV or driving a car, that's a distance task. And so the, the lens in a young person's eye is relaxed. And that same person, if they're simultaneously on their cell phone, well, that's a near object. And so the lens in the eye is accommodating or flexing to bring that into focus. So it's providing extra power. Um, as we get older, the, the lens loses its ability to provide that extra power and that's why pa patients start requiring reading glasses. 
Oh, okay. Um, I, I didn't actually realize that that was what, what was happening there. Um, so in terms of, of cataracts, you mentioned as people age, they tend to get cataracts, but you also mentioned in rare cases, it might even happen when you're born. So could you tell us a little bit more about who is at risk for developing cataracts? You know, the short answer to that is everybody, right? So I often have patients come into my office, come, they come into my lane and they say, you know, doc, I have a family history of cataracts. And sometimes I, I jokingly tell them, you know what, so does every family. Uh, because if you ask around, every family has knows somebody who's had cataract surgery. It is a um, very common age-related condition. Um, and so who, who gets cataracts? The short answer is everybody. But most patients start to get cataracts um, in their 60s and 70s. We do see some patients developing cataracts in their late 40s or 50s. But I, I, I tell you that most of my patients are between maybe 60 and 85 um, who are receiving cataract surgery. We do see rare, this is extremely rare, but we do see um, babies being born with cataracts. We also see young people develop cataracts um, if there's a history of trauma, for example. But the, the, the typical cataract patient is probably somewhere between 55 and 85 years old. Okay, so if everybody is potentially at risk of developing it, are there is there anything that we can do to either prevent it or slow down progression? Yeah, so absolutely. I, I, I mean, UV is probably w one of the biggest modifiable risk factors for the development of cataract. Um, so sunglasses are really important and having UV protection is really important. So uh, I, I, I would say that's probably number one. And then there's some lifestyle factors like smoking, right? Smoking can exacerbate or um, bring upon cataract earlier in life. Uh, and and diet-related things. So sometimes uh, patients who are diabetic, especially if they're poorly controlled diabetics, uh, may be at risk of developing cataracts earlier. And there are some systemic medications um, that can cause cataract earlier. Uh, in particular, uh, steroid, corticosteroid medications, uh, as well as chemotherapies. But again, when, if a patient needs corticosteroid or chemotherapy treatment, I would not, not get that, right? I think that's the priority. And if you happen to develop a cataract, we can easily deal with that. So I, I would never su suggest that you, you don't pursue those. But certainly if, if you're a smoker and you can stop that, if you're a diabetic and you can better control your sugars, or putting on some sunglasses, those are all easy things or, or reasonable things to suggest. Okay, that, make, that makes sense. Um, I know I, I want to talk about cataract treatment, but before we quite get there, I was wondering if you could maybe explain how somebody would know if they had a cataract. So you did mention some of the symptoms that people would have, but is there something that people should look out for mm -hmm. and what happens in the diagnosis process? Yeah, so, so great question. Um, so I, I just want to clarify that my earlier comment about the loss of accommodation, that's just natural aging of the lens. That's not yet cataract. But when someone starts to develop, become symptomatic in the cataract, is you're, 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 you're losing vision as a result of the lens not being clear anymore. And so patients are noticing that their vision is just not as sharp as it used to be. It's blurry. Maybe things are dark, and that's true at all ranges. They're not happy with their distance. They're not happy with their intermediate. They're not happy with their up-close vision. And so their vision is just blurry uh, all the time. They go through their optometrist, and they think maybe they need to update their glasses, but updating the glasses is not sufficient um, because there's a, because the, the lens in, inside the eye is dirty. An example would be like you're driving around with a dirty windshield, okay? Um, and it's just, or, you know, on a rainy night where it's foggy, it's like looking through that, but all the time. Um, and in terms of symptoms, sometimes the earliest symptoms that patients explain are uh, nighttime symptoms. Um, and th the reason for that is because at night, our, our pupils tend to be larger, right? Their pu our pupils are dilated due to the lack of light around. And so that, imp that does cause the cataract to be symptomatic more so than during the day. And when you are, when you go to, so your optometrist or your mm -hmm. ophthalmologist and they're, they're doing an eye test, like what exactly are they looking for that they can see a cataract? 
Yeah, so uh, well, one of the beautiful things about being an optometrist or ophthalmologist, um, being in the eye care field, is that we can see pathology, right? Um, so <clears throat> we look inside the patient's eyes with the slit lamp, and we can actually see the natural lens. We can see if it's clear. We can see if it's um, developed opacities. And so we can look inside and, and, and actually diagnose the cataract directly on sl slit lamp examination. Okay. Um, so moving now into if you have a cataract, how are they treated? And I guess, how does somebody know when they need treatment? So I'll, I'll address the second question first. How does someone know? It's a personal decision. Uh, what I mean by that, a cataract is not a dangerous growth. A, a cataract is not a malignancy. A cataract is not something that must be removed immediately, right? Um, and so what I would say is a cataract needs to be removed when the patient is symptomatic, when it's affecting their lifestyle, it's prohibiting you from doing some of the things you'd like to do. Or, uh, and this is a very common indication, is you're sort of not meeting the driving requirements in your province. So I can't speak for all of Canada, but I know in Ontario, the, the driving requirement is 2050. So 2020 is perfect vision and 2050 means that um, you see from 20 feet away what the average person can see from 50 feet away. And so, so the vision is, is decreased. And so if someone is driving, that usually can be a motivator to get cataract surgery at that time. Um, but again, it is a personal decision because you'll see, especially with mild to moderate cataracts, you could have two patients with exactly the same cataract, with exactly the same vision, and one person is eager for surgery today, um, and the other wants to be left alone for a year. Uh, and both <laughs> are things that happen on a daily basis. So it really is a personal decision as to when to pursue surgery. And discussion that is had uh, with their optometrist uh, and then their ophthalmologist who would be performing the surgery. How we do the surgery, modern cataract surgery is very safe, um, extremely sophisticated and, and um, the success rate is extremely high. The, the, it, for, for many of us, like the complication rate is maybe less than one in a thousand. Like it, it, the, the procedure is, is extremely safe uh, at this time. The way we do the procedure is we make two very small incisions into the cornea, so the clear part of the eye. One incision is maybe about a millimeter and the other is 2.2 millimeters, so very tiny. The larger incision is 2.2 millimeters, which is extremely small. Through that incision, we um, use an ultrasound probe that we insert into the eye. And using the ultrasound probe, we break the cataract into smaller fragments, and then we vacuum them up. And then through that same tiny incision, we implant a new intraocular lens into the eye to replace the cataract that has been removed. Well, that, that was um, that was really interesting. Sorry, I'm just um, going through in my head that the, the image of, of vacuuming up the little pieces of cataracts, I didn't realize that. Um, are there any other treatments other than surgery or is surgery um, the sort of only treatment for a cataract? So great, great question. People have been looking at eye drops to um, treat cataracts. There was a study that came out a few years ago, it's probably around 2016 now, that seemed very promising in nature about an eye drop that could prevent or treat cataract. Nothing has materialized from that end so far. So when someone has a visually significant cataract at this point, the, the definitive treatment still remains surgery. Um, at the early stages of cataract, you can treat it with, with glasses. So uh, at, the, at, at the early stages, the opacity is mild and it's not really causing a reduction in your ability to see letters, it's just changing the glasses prescription. And so what often happens is in the year or two prior to cataract surgery, a patient might update their glasses three or four times uh, because every few months the cataract is causing a shift in the refraction. So early cataracts can be treated with glasses, but eventually um, the definitive treatment remains surgical. And in terms of um, how quickly cataracts progress? Is it, is every person different? And is there ever a point where you would say that a cataract surgery is urgent? Mm -hmm. So everyone is different. Cataracts typically mature slowly. And so 
when I see patients who are sort of on the fence about cataract surgery, I tell them to come back and see me in a year. Um, but I always provide them the caveat that most people who, are, who have mild to moderate cataract can wait a year um, and come back and see me. But there will be the rare person whose cataract develops rapidly in that time. Um, and I, I don't know who's who, um, but I tell them, if that's you, if you notice that your vision is starting to deteriorate um, quite rapidly, come back and see me sooner, of course. Um, but, so it's difficult to predict how fast someone's cataract is going to go, but, but for all comers, the answer is they, they progress slowly. I actually wanted to sort of go back to something you mentioned earlier on about how there are three different types of cataracts. Um, I was wondering if, if there's differences in them between the symptoms people might have or anything that, that it might mean for surgery or treatment. Yeah, great question. So the most common type of cataract is a nuclear sclerotic cataract, and that's just a browning of the natural lens. So when we look inside a young person's eye, the natural lens is totally clear. And um, a nuclear cataract is basically the lens is turning yellow and then brown, right? So it's, just, it's getting darker with time. That type of cataract actually tends to bother people the least, and it's the most common type. And so that's, so that's why we say it's slow growing. The other types of cataracts, like a posterior subcapsular cataract or a cortical cataract, oftentimes, even though they're mild, the symptoms can be out of keeping. So these patients are sometimes more eager to pursue surgery earlier um, than someone who has a nuclear cataract. Um, and again, most patients have components of each, right? But my point is, if someone has an overwhelming cortical or posterior subcapsular cataract, they might be symptomatic earlier. Uh, the treatment remains the same for all three of these types, the surgery is the same um, in, in all those scenarios. So it doesn't really change the procedure much. Okay. Um, and how about if somebody chose not to remove their cataracts? Um, what would you sort of, if, if maybe somebody's afraid of surgery or there's some other reason, like what would you tell them? What could they expect to happen? Yeah. So uh, again, there will be a slow deterioration in their vision. Okay, typically. Um, I don't push anyone into cataract surgery. It's, again, it's not an urgency, typically. Um, but one thing I, I use as a cutoff for my patients is if they're drivers, I, I do tell them to consider surgery before they lose their driver's license because they will get it back once the cataract is gone, but it's a pain in the butt to go through that process. Um, so there's that. What can they expect? I mean, the, the natural course of cataract is that the vision will get worse with time. But I don't want to scare people and that they're, they're going to lose their vision rapidly, but the natural course is that you lose, you, you lose vision, right? So in, in the world, the number one cause of blindness remains cataract, right? So, um, and especially in the developing world where resources are, are not as good, uh, many people have severe or profound vision loss due to cataract um, to the point that they require full-time care um, from family members. So the, the, the natural course of cataract untreated is severe vision loss, but even at that stage, it can be fully treated um, and reversed. Okay, um, it's, it's, it's um, slightly hopeful to know that, the, that surgery sort of always works. Even if you have a very like, advanced type of cataract, you can still um, sort of re reverse the vision loss, which is nice to know. In terms of um, in terms of like after you have surgery, can the cataracts grow back again? This is a common thing that, that comes up. So once you have cataract surgery, the cataract is gone and never comes back. But sometimes people will refer to an after cataract or secondary cataract, or people will even talk about their cataract coming back. And what's that all about? So when we do cataract surgery, the, the natural lens, so your original lens, your cataract, is sitting in an envelope. And we leave that envelope behind intentionally. And the reason for that is we use it as a scaffold into which we insert our new artificial lens. With time, I would say maybe 20% maybe of the time, it's not uncommon, the, the, the envelope in the eye does become a, um, a bit dirty or there's a film that grows and this is behind the natural lens. So it's a misconception to say that the cataract came back, but it's more that there's a film 
growing behind the artificial lens. And this is very easily treated with a laser procedure. So you don't need a surgery again. Uh, it's a simple laser procedure in the office to clear that film out. Um, and once you have that done once, then you never have to worry about any of these things again. So uh, a cataract doesn't come back, but you may need a laser touch up later. And so um, you, you mentioned how small the incisions were when you were mm -hmm. doing the surgery. Um, is that sort of the, that's the standard way it's done, I'm assuming, but would, would that still be painful? And what would somebody expect a, a, after they were doing the surgery or even while the surgery was happening? Interesting. So I just finished a day of surgery today. And if you pulled all my patients, they probably tell you different answers, right? Um, patients do very well with, with cataract surgery. It's not an overly painful procedure, but there are some steps that may be uncomfortable. Okay. Patients are not put to sleep for the procedure. So there's an awareness. Um, so they're feeling the surgeon working around their eyes. Um, they're noticing that something is happening and th they can be a little uncomfortable at certain steps, but we do offer them IV sedation um, to help them relax. So if anybody in the crowd has had a colonoscopy, it's a very similar experience, right? You're, you're not put under general anesthetic for the procedure uh, most of the time, but there's a sed there's sedation. Most patients are relaxed. I had, a one, I had one guy who totally fell asleep today. He was snoring, so he was totally out of it. And he, um, and so I would say the majority of patients find it a very comfortable experience. Um, similar to going to the dentist, right? Like it's not fun necessarily, but it's not terrible either. And, 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 and you get through it. I feel like if you pulled everybody in this call about what they feel about the dentist, you would also get a, a broad range exactly. of answers. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, definitely. And um, in terms of after the surgery, what can you expect, both in terms of recovery, but then also in terms of eyesight? Yeah, so the what you can expect after the surgery in terms of recovery, what I tell my patients is the recovery from surgery, the full recovery is a month. And in that time, you need to limit what you do with respect to um, swimming in particular. So uh, that would include um, not just swimming in a pool, but hot tubs, lakes and things like that, um, and also limit heavy lifting. Um, but the full, so the full recovery is a month and you're also typically on eye drops for a full month. However, the majority of the recovery is within the first week. And even then, the majority of the recovery is within the first two to three days. Um, and so uh, my patients who had surgery today, it's Tuesday. I, I bet you by Thursday or Friday, uh, they'll be seeing a lot better. In terms of what a patient can expect, from, from, from their visual improvement. The way, the way to think about it is whatever vision loss was attributable to the cataract will be restored. And so if the patient only has cataract um, and their vision loss is entirely in, attributable to that, then their vision will return completely. If a patient has, let's say glaucoma or a retinal condition <clears throat> or a corneal condition, then that will still impact that, that will still limit the patient's vision. But the the component attributable to the cataract will be reversed. Okay. So if you didn't need glasses before the cataract started to grow, you won't you won't need glasses again. Is, is that about right? So glasses is a, is a tricky subject here. Um, so when we talk about cataract surgery, the, the main purpose to do the surgery is to remove the cataract and get rid of the film in the eyes. Having said that, with technology these days, we can often get rid of the glasses, at least for distance. And for some patients, we can get rid of the glasses for distance and for near. But I never suggest to somebody that, that they should be getting cataract surgery to get rid of glasses, because that's not the expectation, right? The, the main reason we're doing the surgery is to get rid of the film in the eye, to restore clarity, to, to clear the dirty windshield, right? Um, and if we can get rid of the glasses, that's a bonus, um, but not a guarantee and not the primary purpose of the procedure. Oh, so just, um, so I know that I'm clear. So when you say you can get rid of glasses, is it because the lens you're putting in basically is a special lens that acts as the glasses would act? Um, well, what happens is when we do the surgery, we have to implant, we have to implant a lens in the eye. And um, depending on what the patient's needs are with respect to things like astigmatism, okay, if we, cor if, if we perfectly correct their refractive error while we're at it, meaning we implant exactly the right power lens that they need, 
then they'll be free of the glasses for distance. But it's not a perfect science, right? So even at the best of times, maybe 10 to 15% of times, we were slightly off with the power. Either the, the lens is too strong or too weak. Um, and that's not dangerous. That's not a failure of cataract surgery. That just means the patient needs a pair of glasses afterwards. Um, and so um, we absolutely do try to tailor the lens to that eye, but we have formulas and drawings and all sorts of um, mathematical equations. But at the end of the day, we're dealing with humans and, and anatomy and there's variation in anatomy across humans. And so we're not able to always exactly predict the, the perfect lens power. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, I know my mom actually had cataract surgery over um, earlier this year, and there was that conversation mm. about what sort of lens she should get. And actually part of her, um, when she was making the decision, she was also wondering about what was covered by mm -hmm. provincial mm -hmm. healthcare. So that, I guess, actually feeds in really nicely to the next question about um, are cataract surgeries covered by provincial healthcare and are all the different types of lenses covered? Absolutely. So uh, no one should ever be given the impression or feel that they have to pay anything for cataract surgery. Cataract surgery is entirely covered by OHIP in Ontario or your provincial health plan in whichever province or territory you're in. Um, and, and a cataract or, or a cataract surgery is medically necessary. And so the treatment of it is totally covered in Canada. Um, the misconceptions or the confusion stems from the fact that at the time of cataract surgery, a patient may opt for some components that are not covered by OHIP. And those components have nothing to do with safety or quality or timing of the surgery, okay? Those, the, a patient may, might pay for more advanced testing or a specialty lens. And the entire purpose of those things is to reduce or eliminate the glasses after surgery. But if someone says, you know what, I, I don't care or I don't have the means for that, they, they should still have equal access to cataract surgery and it may just mean that they need a pair of glasses afterwards. Cleared it up actually, because I'm even having that conversation with my mother. I know I was really confused about what what was she was supposed to do and what if she had to pay for something or not pay for something. So that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So no one should ever feel no one should ever feel that they have to pay anything for the, for, for for cataract surgery, um, and it, it, it should only be posited as an option. Um, and it should never, I dislike when people think that they're paying for a better lens or better quality. It's, it's not that, it, it simply is um, more chances of being free of glasses. Okay. Um, I've got a couple more questions and then I'm going to turn it back over to Morgan because I know there's a lot mm -hmm. of audience questions coming in. I want to make sure we leave time for those. But um, one question I have is, is everybody... Um, eligible for cataract surgery, or for example, would there be some other eye condition somebody might have, for instance, glaucoma or an inherited retinal disease, which means they should maybe um, have other conversations before having cataract surgery? Okay, great question. So once someone has a visually significant cataract, they're a candidate for cataract surgery, almost irrespective of whatever else is going on, okay? So having another eye condition does not preclude you from having cataract surgery. I think the only situation where perhaps we would not consider cataract surgery is if the eye did not have visual potential, okay? So we do encounter the rare scenario where someone um, has no light perception in that eye and doing cataract surgery, and it's not because of the cataract, right? They, 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 there's no light perception in the eye from, let's say, a retinal condition or glaucoma or something. Um, and that's the reason. And then they had a cataract develop. Well, reversing the cataract is not going to improve that person's vision. And so, so it doesn't really make sense to do the surgery there. But if, if so that's an extremely rare scenario. Uh, outside of that, many patients have other ocular comorbidities, right? Glaucoma is very common. Macular degeneration is very common, right? Corneal conditions are very common. Um, many, even retinal dystrophies are not uncommon necessarily. 
right? We, we encounter many patients who have these conditions. And so I would say that if, if the patient has an eye condition and then the cataract is contributing more vision loss on top of that, then it makes sense to, 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 to remove the cataract. Thank you, that was a, that was a really clear answer. Um, and the last question for you that I'm, I'm gonna ask you is about um, research and new treatments. So I was just wondering if you know about any new treatments that are coming. You mentioned the drops earlier on, but are there any other treatments in clinical trials or even at earlier stages of research um, for treating cataracts right now? Um, I think at this point, it's more evolutionary than revolutionary in terms of the research. The, the procedure that we're doing if we, I'll be honest, if we never put any more funding into it, it's a very safe procedure for the next thousand years, okay? Like, I think we have really solved this issue. And in a short period of time, right? Um, in the 70s and 80s, and even in the early 90s, the procedure was extremely, was just different and had a totally different safety profile than what we have now, right? The, I, I wouldn't say it's 100%, but the procedure now is extremely safe and I would say we've solved that problem um, for the most part. So much of the research now really is around continuing to improve the safety of the procedure. Uh, but again, we're, we're kind of splitting hairs because we're already kind of there. Um, and also new lens designs. Um, and a lot of that focus now is not on the safety of the procedure, but basically giving patients the best possible vision without glasses for distance and for up close um, and that is the, is, is the focus now. Um, and really, if you think about it in the grand scheme of things, that's like icing on the cake, right? To, to, to have your cataract removed and be free of glasses for all distances is really, um, it, it, it really means that we're doing pretty well overall. Yeah, that, that, that's really, I'm really hopeful. I was wondering, do you know what was that sort of shift in, in the like 70s, 80s, 90s from the old style to the new style? What was the sort of the research revolution there? The ultrasound. So okay. when I mentioned earlier that we do, we, we use an ultrasound back then, and you know what, even now in certain parts of the world, they're still doing that procedure. So what we do is called phacoemulsification, and that refers to the ultrasound probe that we use to break up and then vacuum up the lens. This is expensive technology. Um, although the cost is going down with time and it is being more widely adopted across the world. But um, it, it still does happen. I mean, I've, I, I do some volunteer work abroad and we still do the old procedure, which is called an extracapsular cataract extraction. And in that case, you don't break the lens up into pieces, but you remove it as one big lens. And so you have to make a fairly large incision into the eye. And so it's a bit, because you're making a large incision, um, there's more room for uh, complications. Uh, and so the procedure at that time was just totally different. Um, and the modern cataract surgery in Canada uh, has evolved way past that. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Morgan now, who um, has, I think, our other colleague, Jamie, on the line as well. Absolutely. Thank you both so much. That was that was really great informative. And again, because it's our first one for cataracts, I always learn so much. So uh, I this is my my fun fact about cataracts. The, really, the only thing I know about cataracts is that I wrote my master's thesis about um, representation in visual arts um, for people with disabilities. And one of the things that came up, we talked a lot about Monet. Claude Monet, the impressionist painter, had cataracts in his later life. He actually had cataract surgery. I looked it up in 1923. So this one's been around for a while. Um, but his later works are actually way more vibrant and colorful because he was almost compensating for the fact that his lenses mm -hmm. were cloudy. Um, so his later work is actually really different and really beautiful because he, you know, had this this difference at that time. So, that that's my fun fact about cataracts. You can share with that's all your cool friends. piece of history. I love it. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so before we get to questions, we have so many questions coming in, which is fantastic. Um, I just want to take a few moments to give Dr. Rai a little break and to introduce you to uh, my colleague, Jamie, who's going to talk a little bit about how you can get involved with Fighting Blindness Canada. Thank you so much, Morgan. Yeah, I've, I've been really riveted by this conversation and learning so much. Again, it's, it's hit close to home too. My mother-in-law just had cataract surgery 
uh, a week ago. Um, and so in, in both eyes, so one at a time, but she's had both eyes done. So I feel very um, close to how, you know, common it is, common it is, and um, how much it impacts people um, and their lives. And so it really is wonderful that there are um, opportunities for treatments um, to help people um, uh, deal with their cataracts. So it's great. Um, so hello, everybody. My name is Jamie Alexanderson. I am the Senior Manager of Development at Fighting Blindness Canada. And um, thank you all for joining us today. Um, I know there's almost, I think, 200 people on the webinar today, which is fantastic. Um, I just wanted to take a few moments today to talk with you about our monthly giving program. Um, but I always, before I begin, I also, I always want to thank our core supporters because I know there are a whole bunch of you on the line, current monthly donors to Fighting Blindness Canada. And I know many of you um, who have joined us today, I've seen your name on the list um, to join us for our webinar. And, and I just want to thank you all again. Um, you know, your gifts are making a difference by funding the very best vision research. And uh, the work being done by Fighting Blindness Canada is thanks to your donations. We could not do what we do without your contributions. So thank you. And I know some people on um, the webinar today are wondering maybe how, how you can be involved more, um, perhaps join our monthly donor program. Um, you know, it's such an important part of Fighting Blindness Canada's community. Um, you know, your donations as monthly donors provide a reliable and ongoing funding um, for, you know, so for future projects and long-term investments in vision research are possible. So we invite um, you to join our monthly giving program today. By becoming a monthly donor, you will make a tremendous impact. And, um, you know, please consider a monthly um, donation of $1 a day or $20 a month. Um, whatever amount that's meaningful to you, um, every monthly gift makes a difference. So um, if you are interested and you'd like more information, um, please consider joining our monthly giving program and a special promotion, not that you, anyone needs any additional incentive to support um, vision research, um, but today we are giving away um, a complimentary pair of designer sunglasses. Um, we had them donated by our friends at Marchand, and so we're able to pass along um, those gifts to you. So if you decide to become a monthly donor today, please visit our website at fightingblindness.ca or by phoning 1-800-461-3331. And again, thank you for everyone on the call today and enjoy the rest of your day and enjoy the rest of the webinar. Awesome. Thanks, Jamie. That was great. Um, and I will send in our follow-up email. There'll be a link as well if anyone's interested. Um, instead of having to find it on the website, you can just click through on there as well. All right. So we have so many questions. <laughs> so let's let's get into it. A lot of the questions that we have here, Dr. Rye, are about um, AMD and cataract surgery. Um, so a couple of people have said, you know, they have AMD, they're getting injections, um, the cataract surgery has been recommended, um, and they're just wondering if there's any sort of, um, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, are there any side effects to having the surgery on AMD or should they space out their injections from when they're having cataract surgery? You know, how, how do these two conditions interact? Great question. Very common scenario. Right? With both cataract and macular degeneration being so common, it's not unusual to, ha to have a patient who has macular degeneration to then develop cataract. Um, I, I don't think AMD should preclude anybody from having cataract surgery. I just think that you have to have um, a discussion with your ophthalmologist about what to expect following, following surgery. So AMD will limit your central vision. Um, that, that's typically how AMD affects the patient. And so cataract surgery may not necessarily help you read more letters on the chart in the doctor's office, but certainly your peripheral vision may improve. You may notice improved brightness or contrast, color vision, um, and things like that. The other thing to consider, and again, this is not robust science by any means, but uh, and we as a community, I, like I'm not suggesting I have an answer here, and we as a community go back and forth, but there are some blue blocking intraocular lenses that can be implanted at the time of cataract surgery. And it's thought that blue light may be harmful to the retina um, and that preventing blue light um, may be beneficial to the retina. 
the, re the jury really is out on this. Most of the research is in a lab model with rats. So I, I, I don't want anyone to leave here with the impression that they must get a blue blocker, but certainly it's a question you can ask um, of your ophthalmologist. And I myself go back and forth on the utility of those. That's great. Um, so another a question that I'm seeing a lot of people are asking about are, and I think you touched on this a little bit, but are there ways to sort of delay the progress of cataracts? So for example, one person asked about, are there exercises that they can do? Another person's asked about vitamins. So are there any, any uh, tips or tricks for, for slowing down that progress? It's hard to say, right? Because, um, so for example, it'd be impossible to really do large scale studies in humans to, to see if something worked, right? Because we'd have to enroll people in their 20s and 30s and follow them on for 50 years to see what worked and what didn't work, right? And by then the researchers would have passed and tell us. So it's really hard to do large scale studies on humans on cataracts. Uh, what we know is lifestyle modification. So a healthy diet um, in general will help uh, slow down the progression, but it's not to suggest that a patient who has who has cataract or needs cataract surgery is unhealthy or has an unhealthy diet. Um, there's just things that are out of our control. Um, our genetics, for example, right? Some patients, some families just develop cataracts earlier than others, and there's not much about not much we can do about that. Um, sun, sun exposure again. We've already talked about. You can modify your your sun exposure um, and. I guess another thing I would just put a plug for is if anybody is playing contact sports, especially things like basketball where fingers go into eyes sometimes, um, just wearing safety goggles in general is a good idea um, for sports like that. Or also if you're, if you're doing construction or carpentry or, or, or whatever, you don't want stuff flying into your eyes. And that's just general um, recommendations that are good for the eye and may help limit cataract progression. But again, it's, it, I, I don't think there's, I, I don't think the patients who, who develop cataracts have done something wrong necessarily. Are there any specific, like we've, we've talked, I know in other webinars about, for example, like AMD, like eating green leafy vegetables, you know, your brightly colored fruits and vegetables, any particular, um, Helen's asking if there's any particular diet, dietary foods or tips, vitamins, things like that, that, that would help, or is that still not really known? Not really. I mean, I, I do talk to my pa AMD patients about green leafy vegetables. There's good research on that. For my cataract patients, I would say, honestly, the biggest tips would be if you're diabetic to make sure you have that well controlled. And if you're a smoker, try to stop that. Um, so it's not so much the healthy stuff, it's stopping the unhealthy stuff. For sure. Um, so I have a couple of questions about um, the interaction between uh, RP and cataracts. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll, I'll let you know both of them and, and then you can answer. So um, one person is asking, why are some people with RP diagnosed uh, with cataracts at an early age? And then um, Brenda is saying that she has RP and is, is actually having her cataract surgery tomorrow, um, but she found out that she doesn't have a particular choice in the lens. They said she's having a monofocal tor toric lens uh, because of a high astigmatism. Um, and she's just wondering, you know, uh, why they don't have a different lens um, and if you have any advice on that. Okay, so let's start with the easier question first, which is the first one. Um, you know, why do patients with RP get diagnosed earlier with cataract? Well, I think um, we don't really know why that is, but they develop a very um, common, so it, 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 patients with RP tend to develop a posterior subcapsular cataract. Um, and so as we talked about earlier, there's three main types. PSC cataract is a type that patients with RP tend to develop. Um, and the PSC cataract tends to bother people earlier. Um, and so, it's difficult to say what came first, the chicken or the egg, right? But patients develop, patients with RP develop the type of cataract that you do become symptomatic from earlier. Um, so, I, but I don't really have a great answer as to why they develop that type of cataract necessarily. I would just say that um, for, with, in some ways, I don't want people to be afraid of cataracts, right? Um, I think one message I would have for the audience is in some ways it's a badge of honor, right? Um, you've lived long enough to have a cataract, right? The alternative is that you passed away young and that's not a better alternative. So 
And so whenever I have patients who are afraid of cataract surgery, I say, listen, this is a good thing, right? Like you, you made it, right? So congratulations to you. So it, it's not something to be necessarily be afraid of. I don't, and I don't say that in a way to make light of the whole procedure. It is a serious thing. And um, I know for me, I do a lot of cataract surgery, so it, it, I'm very relaxed about it. Um, but I always remember that for my patient, it's a big deal. Uh, so I'm not making light of the, the, the procedure, but I don't want people to be afraid of the procedure either. That's great. Thank you. And um, so another person. Oh, sorry, the other, I'm sorry, yeah. I forgot to address the second question. Um, with, so Brenda's question here with respect to lens choices. Uh, again, it's difficult for me to comment specifically on a patient's uh, condition without having access to their eye and, and their testing. But in general, a monofocal toric lens is a good idea. Um, and so I, especially if you have astigmatism, which it sounds like you do, uh, a monofocal toric lens is a great idea. Um, you're, you're asking why you weren't given an extended range of vision lens. Um, sometimes those aren't the best idea. Sometimes those aren't the best idea for a patient who has uh, other coexisting eye condition. So I, I suspect it's related to that. Um, and I can't really comment more, but I, I think a monofocal toric lens is a good idea. That, that's great, thank you. Um, so another question that I'm seeing here a few times is about um, doing surgery on one or both eyes. Um, some people are asking, can you do surgery on both at the same time? Um, others are asking, you know, are there advantages or disadvantages to that? And uh, if you are doing them at different times, um, what do you suggest as the good interval between? Great question. Evolving answer. So what I would say is that Pre-COVID, most of us um, cataract surgeons in Canada were doing one eye at a time. There were people already doing bilateral surgery, um, like bilateral simultaneous same-day surgery, uh, but most of us were doing one eye at a time. Why? Because there is a very rare risk of infection, and that's infection inside the eye. The rate of that is probably one in 6,000 or less. Um, so extremely rare, but it was thought that you should always just do one at a time. And a, a lot of this, again, a lot of these habits were developed back in the 80s and in the 70s or, or early 90s when the procedure was different, really. Um, and those are just habits that stuck with us and were passed down from generation to generation. And that's just how we did things. Um, with COVID, it's made us rethink everything. Right? not just in cataract surgery, but in, in society, right? Everything is being reevaluated. And now booking elderly patients for two cataract surgeries doesn't just mean two cataract surgeries. There's post-op visits. So post-op day one, post-op week one, maybe post-op month one. So that's three post-op visits. And if you have one at a time, you need six post-op visits plus two surgeries. So eight visits potentially. Um, whereas if you do bilateral surgery, you cut all those visits in half. Uh, and so uh, over the last year, where it became really important to limit the number of people in the office, where it became important to limit how often our patients were leaving home to go to healthcare facilities, we started to consider bilateral surgery. So my answer is, I think both one eye at a time and bilateral surgery at the same time are reasonable options. I offer my patients both options. Uh, and I think it's, I think it's very reasonable to consider either in the, the main determinant now is my patient's comfort with it. So some patients are eager to do both eyes at the same time. It's, it's a no brainer to them. Like, why wouldn't you? Whereas other patients are nervous about the procedure. And so I say, okay, well, let, we'll do one at a time, of course, right? Um, what's the ideal time between the eyes? You know, there's no right answer to that, right? So most surgeons are not operating on back-to-back -back days, but in theory, you could do them back-to-back -back days. Some people like to wait a week. Some people like to wait two weeks. Some people like to wait a month. Uh, but there, there's no right answer to, to that. I think they're all safe intervals. Yeah, it's, it's nice, again, right now, especially to have that flexibility to have that choice because, uh, you know, everyone has different, you know, comfort level with being, you know, in the hospital, in appointments, you know, going out to different things. So that, that's really good to hear. Um, I have a question here about cataracts. Or does cataract surgery cause dry eyes? Uh, so great question, very common issue. Dry eye is a very common problem um, 
especially in older patients, especially in women. But over the last year, um, it's become a big problem for everybody with the excessive screen time. So the more time we spend at screens, the more uh, uh, dry our eyes tend to be because we're not blinking as frequently. So in general, dry eye is a problem and very common in the cataract population. But cataract surgery does exacerbate dry eye for at least a short period of time, maybe three to six months. Um, after that time, people are back to their baseline. And so if you have pre-existing dry eye going into the procedure, you'll be back at that level. Um, so about, at the most three to six months, but often it's not much worse than what patients were experiencing before. Great. Um, let's see here. So we have lots of questions about the lenses. So let me see if we can try mm -hmm. to. Um, so, um, so someone here asked, um, so they're saying they're having cataract surgery. Uh, they've been told they can upgrade the lens, not covered under OHEP, um, and they can choose to pay for a test to determine, and she said she can't recall, um, but she says, does it make sense to purchase a better lens and do this test? And then there's someone else who's asking about measurements. The only thing that struck me is they said that it was also $300 for this measurement test. So how does that work? Is, is that required or needed? Okay. So I can tackle that. I know what they're getting at. So what, what patients are referring to here is when we do cataract surgery, we have to implant a lens in the eye. And as a cataract surgeon, what I'm doing is I'm calculating what power lens to put in the eye to eliminate the glasses while we're at it. So I want to step back and remind everybody that the main reason we're doing cataract surgery is to remove the cataract, right? It has nothing to do with glasses. So that's a secondary benefit of the procedure, right? We're all familiar with LASIK. LASIK is another procedure entirely. And the entire purpose of LASIK is to get rid of glasses. Um, cataract surgery is not LASIK. So the, the main reason we're doing the surgery is to get rid of cataract. So no one should ever feel compelled or forced to pay for anything that they don't want to. But are there benefits to some of these advanced tests? There are, uh, and I do offer them to my patients and I'll, I'll explain to you what, what it does. So in Ontario anyways, and I can't speak for all the provinces, but in Ontario, uh, what's covered under OHIP is a test called the ACE scan. It's an ultrasound that takes a measurement of the length of the eye. And there is, so that's, that's based on sound energy. There is a more advanced machine that is better, okay? It's about 10 times more accurate than the ultrasound and it's called optical biometry. And it uses light energy to measure the length of the eye. And with more accuracy, you're better able to, it's not a guarantee, but you're better able to predict exactly what power lens to put in that eye so that they don't need glasses for distance. Um, and so th that's why someone would pay for that test is if they want to get rid of their cataract and hopefully not need glasses for distance. Um, again, paying for this test does not mean you get better surgery, does not mean you get safer surgery or sooner surgery or anything like that. What it means is that you're more likely to um, be able to see at the distance without glasses. Um, so I think someone here also asked, um, does the surgery correct astigmatism? So I know you'd mentioned that before. Does it, will it correct the, the astigmatism with the lens? Again, so astigmatism is not a disease. Astigmatism basically means that the eye is um, not round like a soccer ball, but it's oval like a football. And astigmatism is something that can be corrected with glasses or contact lenses. But if someone chooses at the time of cataract surgery, they can upgrade to an implant that corrects astigmatism from within. So that's what the previous commenter was also getting at. Uh, so that's a toric lens. So a toric lens can correct astigmatism from within the eye. Uh, and again, that's optional. Um, it's not necessary, but it is nice to have because it can, it can correct that and give you the best possible distance vision without glasses. Um, so in, in regards to the lenses as well, um, you, you know, you mentioned some extra tests and I know you've just talked about the measurement. Are there other extra tests that people might consider getting or is that sort of the primary one? So optical biometry, which refers to um, tests like the Iowa Master or the LensStar is probably the first thing that, that patients are being offered. And then there is some advanced analysis of the cornea called topography 
um, which can be very useful, especially if doing lenses like, like toric lenses or multifocal lenses. And so those are probably the two most commonly offered uh, additional tests. Um, and then the other question here about lenses that I see, um, uh, Betty Ann asks, is the replacement lens able to change its shape to focus at different distances? Who asked that? Was that uh, this is Betty Ann. Betty Ann, you're, you're, you're ahead of your time. Um, so in an ideal world, that's exactly what we would do. Okay, so um, that's a great question. I love how she's thinking. So uh, in, in an ideal world, if you recall, the young person's lens, before it got dirty, it, it, it was a clear lens and it was changing shape in the eye. It was flexing, it was accommodating to provide you that range of vision. So really what we should do is aim to replicate that, right? Uh, implant a lens that can change shape, that can accommodate, that can flex. We've tried, uh, and by we, I mean we as a society, um, and we haven't been successful to date with that, but I do imagine that people are going to continue to work on that because why reinvent the wheel, right? Why do anything different than what, than what worked naturally? Um, but we just haven't been successful in that. So if Betty Ann's got any ideas, I'll take them. Uh, great. Um, so let's see. Oh, here's another one that's interesting. Um, so Anne's asking, when breaking up a cataract, um, you know, you talked about vacuuming up those particles. So can there, can there be any debris particles left behind? Uh, would those be a danger or are they uncomfortable? Yeah, so good question. Rarely that does happen. So when you break up the cataract, um, you then vacuum it up. And in theory, it is possible to leave something behind. It does happen. Um, so I've done thousands of surgeries and I have left it behind on two occasions, a small fragment. Um, and you have to go back and get it. It's not dangerous necessarily, but it causes inflammation in the eye. It can cause pressure in the eye. Uh, it can cause swelling of the cornea. Um, and so if that, and this can happen to anybody, right? It's, it's not that your surgeon was incompetent or did a bad job, or it's a failure of cataract surgery. These things do happen, right? Like surgery is surgery. Um, and it, 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 despite our best efforts, occasionally there is a lens fragment that somehow it, it remains behind. Uh, and we see it, at, let's say one week or one month post-op when we see the patient at the slit lamp. Um, so easy problem to fix, okay? You have, unfortunately, it means you have to go back to the OR a second time. Um, so obviously we, we do our absolute best to avoid this scenario. We're not intentionally doing this, um, but it, it's, it's an easy fix. So I wouldn't say it's dangerous, but it's not ideal um, and certainly should be, should be repaired. So we talked a little bit about um, RP in cataracts. We have some questions about some other conditions as well. So uh, Michael's saying, if uh, someone has cataracts and keratoconus, is there a type of lens that you would recommend? Michael, that's a great question and a question that we as cataract surgeons debate all the time, okay? Um, so often patients with keratoconus do have astigmatism and we've kind of alluded to in this session tonight that you can, you can correct astigmatism with a toric lens. The problem with that is astigmatism, there's different types of astigmatism and toric lenses only correct regular astigmatism. And patients with keratoconus can sometimes have, or often have irregular astigmatism. And you cannot correct that with a toric lens. Having said that, certain patients with keratoconus are still amenable to a toric lens. So, um, so I guess my answer would be, you have to it, it depend on each patient and you have to again talk to your surgeon, um, but potentially a toric lens can be used in that scenario, but not always. Okay, so what about uh, glaucoma surgery and cataracts at the same time? Uh, is that ideal, recommended, even possible? It is possible. Uh, if someone needs um, glaucoma surgery and cataract surgery, I would say it's ideal to get them done together, right? Um, so it's not uncommon for patients to be getting the two procedures at the same time. And I, 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 I would say, yes, I think it's ideal that they're done together if the patient needs both. Yeah, I mean, obviously reducing the amount of surgery and the times you have to go in is always, I mm -hmm. think, better, right? 
Um, so Sabrina says here, I have a cataract that developed after surgery to repair a retinal detachment. Um, so she's currently waiting to have cataract surgery. Uh, and this is, so should she have another uh, detachment in the future, would there be any issues to have uh, the, her retina fixed? Not really, no. So, so Sabrina, it's very common for patients to develop cataract after retinal detachment repair, especially if you had a vitrectomy procedure. So there's different ways to repair retinal detachment, but the most commonly formed procedure to fix a retinal detachment is what's called a pars plane of vitrectomy. And about 90% of patients require cataract surgery within two years of the vitrectomy. So this is a very common scenario that she's described. Uh, if anything, um, having the cataract fixed, having the the, the the opacity removed and a clear lens put in would help the retina surgeon in the future if she were to have a, another retinal detachment because they'd be able to see clearly. Um, when you have a cataract, the patient doesn't see well, but you know what? The, the, the doctor who's examining you also has, a ha also has difficulty seeing through the cataract to the back of your eye. So um, if anything, it'll help them see better. Um, what, one, one piece of advice, of course, would be to make sure that she has a good retinal examination prior to the surgery, uh, to make sure that uh, if there's any areas of weakness or retinal tears, that they're addressed with laser prior to the, the cataract surgery. Great. And then Glendon says, um, you know, this is a really interesting perspective. So he says he has a, he's a person with choroideremia and mm -hmm. he's been told that he's, he may be more likely to develop uh, cataracts as he gets older. Um, but because of his extreme light show and um, bubbles in his visual fields, he doesn't think that he'd actually be able to recognize a cataract himself. Um, so he said his, the question is like, does he really need to worry about that? Um, would cataracts in his case eventually need to be addressed or can they cause other issues other than vision loss? So that's a great question. I would, I would say that in terms of the impact of cataract, if you're not, like, like if you have a mild cataract, and, you're, and you haven't noticed a significant change in your function, then perhaps cataract surgery isn't yet warranted, right? Um, but having an annual exam with your, with your optometrist or your ophthalmologist, so they can, they can monitor the cataract um, and help you decide when is the right time to, to get the surgery. The, other, the caveat I will add to that is sometimes cataract is so slow growing that the patient doesn't notice it and yet the cataract has gotten quite large. And at that time, perhaps removing it would, would help the patient see better, even though they may not have realized that they've got an advanced cataract. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so Dorothea also says she has early stage cataracts. Mm -hmm. um, she's 16, 69 years old, um, and, but she finds that they cause light blurring and there's a discomfort from glare, from bright lights, um, stars around headlights, that kind of thing. And she's wondering, are there any drawbacks long-term for getting surgery early like in the early stages? Not really. So I think if you're symptomatic and you're having issues like halos or glare at nighttime, um, that can often be one of the first signs of cataract, especially like a cortical or a posterior subcapsular cataract. Um, and I don't think that there's any harm in getting cataract surgery now versus five years from now. Um, the, I don't see the procedure being materially different at that time. Um, the only thing that may change is perhaps the, the, the lenses are constantly changing, um, but I wouldn't wait for the next generation of lenses necessarily to have cataract surgery because you're gonna to have to live with that visual disturbance for the next five or 10 years. And the lenses may not be that different in that time because um, there's always going to be new, it's, there's always gonna be a new iPhone every year, right? So, but, you, but when you need a new phone, you have to get a new phone. You don't wait for the one, two or three years down the road, right? There's always going to be new technologies that are incremental improvements, but I don't think that's a reason to wait. But other, other than that, I don't see any reason um, this the surgery is really safe and, and is not going to be materially different in a few years. And um, Cheryl had a related question to that. And she says, um, do rings around lights at night, like those sort of halos, does that mean, does that necessarily mean that cataracts are developing? That is a very common sign of cataracts. So it, it, that's often something that drives people to see their optometrist uh, and first get diagnosed with cataract or see their ophthalmologist. Um, so certainly that, that would be uh, a sign of cataract, yep. 
Um, okay, we're getting low on time, but I will do a couple more questions. Mm -hmm. um, so this one's from uh, Doris. So, so Doris says that she had cataract surgery a year ago, a year and a half ago in both of her eyes. Um, but then two times her ophthalmologist uh, did a, a different treatment to the new lenses that helped her see more clearly. Um, she doesn't say the name of that treatment. Mm -hmm. um, she says, mm -hmm. how many times could that treatment be done? And is it possible to change the lenses later on? Okay, so um, what she probably had, again, again, I, I've never examined her or, or seen her chart, but what she probably had is what I talked about earlier is, is the cataract coming back after cataract, secondary cataract. And the, 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 the official term for that is posterior, posterior capsular opacification, or PCO. And what that means is the envelope or the capsule that the original cataract was sitting in is now housing the artificial lens, but it has developed an opacity, right? And that's not unusual, right? You have to remember that the, the, the capsule belongs to the cataract. It has cells from the original cataract, and those are replicating and causing a film behind the lens. We accept this. We know this is going to happen, right? It's very common that this happens. And the reason we accept this trade-off is there is no better place to put the lens than where the original lens was sitting. And if someone develops a film, we can very easily laser that. Typically, you, ne you don't need to have the laser more than once per eye. And so if you've had cataract surgery and you've had the laser once, you don't need either of those things again. The second question, can the lens be exchanged? Yes, but I don't encourage it, right? So um, cataract surgery is a very safe procedure. Implanting the lens is a very safe thing. Exchanging the lens is not easy. It's technically feasible. I do it, um, but I don't take it lightly. Okay, removing the lens is not necessarily an easy task. Um, the, the artificial lens, removing that artificial lens is not necessarily an easy task. Um, and unless someone has a really compelling reason to do so, I would encourage patients not to be seeking that treatment out um, routinely. Great. So I, I know we're at time. There's still so many questions. So I'm going to ask one more and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll stop. Um, so this question came from Deborah and she said, I'm sure you've worked extensively with optometrists referring to you. Mm -hmm. uh, would you say that optometrists are central to the system of cataract diagnosis, treatment and follow-up? And can you give us an example of, you know, a bit of that patient journey? So what do they go through from the time that they're referred to you until after the surgery? What does that look like? For sure. I mean, I, I think Deborah is correct. Most patients are receiving the diagnosis of cataract uh, at their optometrist office, right? Um, because typically what happens is patients um, think that their or notice that their vision is not as good as it used to be. And well, what's the first thing we always think of? Well, I got to get my glasses updated, right? Either I need an updated prescription or my glasses are scratched or something. Uh, and I, I need to go see my optometrist to get the glasses updated. Uh, and, and then when they get there, the, the optometrist may be the first person to mention to them, say, hey, actually, you've got cataract here. Um, and so at that stage, they may update the glasses because as I, we talked about at the early stages, that can fix um, the problem somewhat. But eventually, they will refer them to an ophthalmologist for cataract surgery. That, that is a very common um, patient journey is to see their optometrist first. Absolutely. All right. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Rai. This has been so informative. Again, this is our first session we've done on cataracts. So really learned a lot. And um, it, thank you just for being generous with your time and being here today. I'm sorry we didn't get to everyone's questions, um, but if you do have questions that weren't answered today, um, you know, we are here for you. You can reach out to our health information line, uh, health info at fightingblindness.ca, and we can help you um, to get the answers that you need.